American Freedom Train, AFT-1, Chessie's Team Special, or simply Reading 2101. The massive steam locomotive you see behind me today has a very storied past, and one that we will uncover for you today in a historical and honest fashion. What you see behind me, according to the white classification system for steam locomotives, is a 484. You say, well, what does that mean? You say, well, that means we have four leading wheels, we have eight massive driving wheels, and four trailing wheels underneath the firebox there. But that was not always the case for this steam locomotive. In the early 20s, the Reading Railroad was in need of a new freight hauling locomotive that could hold its own. So, in 1923, the railroad went to the Baldwin Locomotive Works and asked for a 2 consolidation that could produce at least 70,000 pounds of tractive effort. And produce 70,000 pounds of tractive effort it did. Baldwin's engineering department surely delivered. Between 1923 and 1925, Baldwin built 50 of these chunky locomotives with Reading's well-known Wooten Firebox. The design of the firebox came in the 1870s from John E. Wooten, a former superintendent of motor power at the Reading Railroad who was looking for a cost-effective way to burn waste from anthracite coal called comb. The generally wide dimensions of the firebox, amongst other features, allowed for a thin firebed and light draft in order to keep the basically powdery comb from being sucked right up the stack. Not all that glimmers is gold, though, as Mr. Wooten's design did face some criticism and teething problems. But the general drift of management reports was for Mr. Wooten to continue a long-range construction program for this new type of firebox. So now with a quick history of the Wooten firebox out of the way, let's jump back to the 1920s. Originally built in 1925 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works for the Reading Railroad, number 2037, a 280 consolidation, would be no different from any of her other stablemates as she pulled low-speed heavy drag freights over the mountains of Pennsylvania. But that's where her mediocrity would end, and her stardom would slowly rise. The early 40s was a major turning point for the Reading Railroad. 1942, the motor power superintendent became one Ernest Paul Gangweir. Two years later, in 1944, the president of the railroad switched from Edward Shear to Ravel W. Brown, a known steam fan. Reading's new motor power superintendent, Gangweir, a fan of the shiny new diesel electrics, wrote in a letter to two gentlemen in the Railroad's Engineering Department about possibly converting the Railroad's existing 2102 Santa Fe's or the I-10 Class 280's to a larger 484 wheel arrangement. We can assume this was from pressure felt from above, as we already talked about. Reading's new president, Rebel Brown, was very fond of steam in light of the new diesel electrics that were making their rounds. A meeting between a Baldwin Locomotive Works representative and President Brown was held in early August of 1944 to discuss possible construction of the new proposed 484 locomotives. Of the design and styling proposed, the Reading's VP, William Curren, actually sent E.P. Gangweir a profile picture of the B&O's newest outshopped President Class 462 Pacific. Curren wanted the lines of the new T1 to be very similar to the clean lines of the rehabilitated B&O engines. With World War II in full swing, the Wartime Production Board staunchly denied the Reading from building a brand new locomotive. As history would tell us, the Reading would not take no for an answer. Using drawings and engineering from Baldwin Locomotive Works, Reading proceeded to build their own 484s in-house. In response, Reading would move 30 of the I-10 SA-280 consolidations, number 2020 through 2049, to their massive locomotive shops in their namesake town of Reading. It was here that the new 484s would take shape. A common word in the railroad community that refers to these locomotives is rebuilds. But in a practical sense, that's not really the case. As Steve Workersham, the CMO for 2101 and 614, has stated many times, the 10 SAs, the 280 consolidations, were organ donors for these locomotives. And organ donors meaning they only gave the firebox and the dome course. And Steve is not wrong. Everything besides the firebox and the dome course 
was reused by Redding on other projects that they had, and everything else besides that firebox and the dome course was sourced from places like General Steel Castings, Timken, and Baldwin themselves. So, in practical terms, is it a rebuild? No, I don't, I would say no, I agree with Steve. I think here we say that this was a brand new locomotive, but Redding used that term rebuild to skirt around the wartime production board's current restrictions that were in place during the time. Along with 19 other T1s, as the Redding would call them, newly number 2101, emerging from the sprawling shops in Redding, PA in 1945, was put to work as a mixed-use locomotive. Mixed-use meaning they could either haul passengers or freight along the Redding's roughly 1,300 miles of track. Our new friend, 2101, would live most of its life in relative quietness until July 28, 1949. And you say, well, what's so special about that date? Well, in Harrisburg, PA, on that sultry July day in 1949, 2101 neared a switch near VK Tower inside Rutherford Yard. Either her crew didn't notice, or it was already too late, but they headed through a trailing point switch that was thrown against them. According to reports and photos, the tender stayed upright while the huge T1's engine portion rolled onto the engineer's side. The photos do look worse than the actual damage after she was upright. A few bent handrails, some crushed sheet metal, and some other minor damage would be the direct result of the mishap, but that was nothing Redding's talented shop forces couldn't remedy. In short order, the T1 was back out and on the road hauling freight again, living a rather uneventful life until it was taken out of regular service in 1955, it was kept as a standby engine for the famed Redding Iron Horse Rambles. Three of 2101's sister locomotives, 2100, 2102, and 2124, were all used through the duration of the Redding's exclusive passenger excursions from 1959 to 1964. Sometimes, double heading in order to pull the long passenger trains through the hills and mountains, the T1s did not disappoint their loyal fans that came out in droves to ride, video, and photograph these Herculean monsters. With the end of the Ramble tourist excursions in 1964 and complete dieselization of the American railroads, our buddies at the Reading Railroad would sell 2100 and 2101 to Striegel Supply and Equipment, a Baltimore scrapyard. But all is not lost, and nor does our story end here, friends. The scrapper's torch would not come near the forgotten 2101, though. In 1974, with both 2100 and 2101 rusting away in Baltimore's Striegel scrapyard, we head up north to find a commodities broker named Ross E. Rowland pitching a grand idea. After a long uphill slug, Rowland was able to sell the idea of a bicentennial train to celebrate America's 200th birthday. With sponsors like General Motors, Kraft Foods, Pepsi, and Prudential Insurance, Rowland was able to gain traction to fund a steel rail parade of America's most coveted historical objects. But what would pull these customized rail cars from city to city throughout the United States? showing off America's treasures. Well, in the age of diesels, Roland thought it fitting to have a steam locomotive. Steam wasn't completely gone from the public's memory, but in 1974, where does one find a steam locomotive? Well, in a Baltimore City scrapyard, that's where. Familiar with Redding's Iron Horse Rambles, Roland visited Striegel's scrapyard to find 2101 looking less than admirable. But through the eyes of Roland's experienced steam locomotive mechanics and machinists, 2101 was deemed fit for operational restoration. 2100 was purchased as well to serve as a spare parts locomotive. Towed out of Striegel's in February 1975, 2101 was taken to Chessie Systems Riverside Shops south of Federal Hill. Under the guise of experienced steam mechanics, 2101 would undergo restoration that would bring her back to steaming in five weeks. Yes, five weeks. Perseverance does pay off. December 19th, 1974, sitting on the observation car of the American Freedom Train at the Alexandria Railway Station in Alexandria, Virginia, President Gerald R. Ford would dedicate the journey of that train, a journey that would live on in history. On March 28th, 1975, painted in a rather basic livery, 2101, now known as AFT-1, would begin her trek over several thousand miles hauling the American Freedom Train. Used on the eastern leg of the American Freedom Train, AFT-1 shared the duties with the restored Southern Pacific Daylight Number 4449, which would pull the western leg, as well as Texas and Pacific Number 610, which pulled the train through the state of Texas. 
As the train traveled from city to city, it showcased such prodigious American treasures as George Washington's copy of the U.S. Constitution, Willie Mays' bat and glove, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s vestments and Bible. Sourced from a variety of public and private collections, as well as the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., these items will provide a reinvigorated American spirit to any who would behold their majesty and splendor. After two years and thousand miles traversing the eastern section of the United States, AFT-1 would sit in a Lebanon rail yard until another reveille would wake it from its slumber. 1977 and 1978 would mark the sesquicentennial for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And what better way to celebrate than with a massive steam locomotive? Ross Rowland would work with the Chessie System, a corporate conglomeration of the B&O, C&O in Western Maryland, to create the Chessie Steam Special, a chance meeting between Rowland and B&O's former lead of passenger service, William F. Howes, would spark the call for this celebration. Rowland's pitch to the Chessie board of a steam engine traveling along old B&O trackage was a success, and with that, 2101 was painted into Chessie colors of yellow, vermilion, and dark blue. Beginning in May of 1977, the 2101 would pull the special train from Baltimore to Ellicott City and beyond until September of that year, where she was deemed to have uh, too many mechanical issues to continue. Diesels would replace 2101 on the remaining Chessie Steam specials, but our story and 2101s does not end here. Taken to the former Reading Locomotive Shop in Reading, PA, 2101 was given a complete overhaul, and in May of the following year, 1978, 2101 was back out on the high iron in better shape and wisping passengers along the old routes of the B&O. Pulling sold out trips from May to September 1978, 2101 and the Chesty Scene Special stand as one of the greatest public relations tools for a railroad. After the amazingly successful trips along the old B&O main line, the 2101 would be stored in a Chessy roundhouse in Silver Grove, Kentucky. Sadly, on March 7, 1979, a fire swept the roundhouse, severely damaging the locomotive. Although not directly Chessy's fault, the president, Hayes T. Watkins, of the Chessy system did feel a sense of remorsefulness at the tragic fire. A deal was struck between Roland and Watkins for another steam locomotive at the B&O Railroad Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, and Roland set to work having 2101 painted back as AFT-1. In a public ceremony in the museum's front yard on Labor Day 1979, Ross Roland exchanged deeds of the AFT-1 for the Chesapeake and Ohio 484 number 614. Roland would go on to take 614 onto numerous excursions and accomplish many feats, while AFT-1 would sit in the front yard of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum as a reminder of one of the greatest railroad shows on earth, the American Freedom Train. <laughs>